do a very, very brief introduction of Sandra Fulton Fay. She's a writer, author, actress, and a very, very talented young woman. Uh, so kindly open up your heart to have a very, very, very dynamic experience with her as she opens up her pool of resources and share with you. Thank you. Um, hi guys, good evening. Again, I really apologize for everything that happened. The slides that we had crashed and I had to pull them again, I was, it was quite devastating, but I'll do my very best to make sure that whatever you came to get, you get. Um, the person who's supposed to work on this is running around, so I don't know how chaotic it's gonna be. I'll try my very best. All right, so um, before I go into this, I want to briefly introduce the book we're about to read. I also want to uh, play some of the characters because this book is a period piece and the characters are not necessarily set from this time. So I'm going to show you some of the visuals. That it was supposed to be on a big dramatic screen, but again, let's make it do. All right. Very importantly, guys, I don't know how many of you have like um, an Amazon account or if you have a card of books, you can look at it free today so you can follow the reading. Otherwise, I'm going to have to read and maybe I rely on another author who is here in the house as well to co read with me because I don't want to sound like I'm the only one talking. That's okay. Okay, so, so basically, um, this book was written in 2014. And the reason why it's important that we mention that is the topic of this particular conversation is about partnerships. Um, the African continent and how are we moving forward, understanding what our unique past is and how we want to use our power as young people to change the narrative for Africa. So one of the things that we did do was to partner with different schools all over Cameroon, there was about 100,000 students. And the goal there was to teach impact because the very, very first rule of any kind of partnership is what exactly do you want to achieve? So in terms of the genre, for those of you who are big readers, uh, this is historical fiction. Uh, what that means is that it relies on history and then it adds some facts to make it more interesting. So I'm going to read one chapter and then you read another one. So we're reading chapter one and chapter 18. The reason why we're reading chapter one is to introduce the book to introduce the period of when this is happening. And then we're going to read chapter 18 to introduce colonialism, which will be the theme of today's conversation. All right, so, uh, what is your name? Ume, Ume, Kume. Very nice to meet you, Kume. Where are you from? Delta State, okay. And, uh, okay, perfect, so. I'm going to start with the book. There are some words that are a little bit unfamiliar because of the language. It's actually written in Lamso, which is my dialect. All right. So in 1847, my village formed part of two strips of land on the eastern border of Yola, separated by a stretch of land south of the Benue River where the Nigerian border bulged to the east. This village was found in the then southern Cameroons where past legacy reigned. He was therefore nicknamed Wero Tabin by a body population of young apprentices who had recently relocated to our village from the big city. Most of them who had remained unemployed since the end of the Second World War because the British and, and French colonial masters had since confiscated the Woman Corporation, a giant German plantation in Victoria that employed laborers from Northwest and Southwest of Cameroon. It was heavy the biggest market day in the village. 
being a lean seven-year-old rabble rouser wearing a tight multiple braids on my hair, I watched keenly from behind a small creaky window as Ma, her dumb shit tagged, and dozens of eager buff young men wearing almost nothing but mere tear around their genitals swung to a compound as usual to hear my past speak before leaving with my brothers for his habitual business trips to Yola. Some of them had stopped hoping that Pa would choose them as apprentices. This accounts for why they never came. A young, eager lad sat expectantly on a tiny bench that curiously hosted all of them. In his hands could be seen old cane baskets filled with gifts of eggs, goat milk, and fried grasshoppers sent by their mothers to soft, soften past heart so that he could take them on his trip. He was an autonomous indigenous trader who sold kola nuts with his sons in Yola, which was then under the British colonial rule and jointly administered as part of neighboring Nigeria. These days he even sold sugar and matches in neighborhood kingdoms like Fumban and Kampe. He was without doubt the most successful non-Christian businessman in Shison. My older brothers Same and Vedukov assisted Pa in collecting the baskets while the other two Fonlon and Zer ate alongside the guests. Their plates were heaped with giant mounds of fufu so plentiful that they couldn't see each other. After all, they would need all their strength at nightfall for the great journey ahead. Crisp, um, crackling sparks of blazing wood could be heard in that compound as the pungent, gamey smell of goat meat rose into the air. Chunky pieces of ribs and loins that had been well marinated with country onions sizzled on a thin sheet of black grill, which had seen baser days. A noisy chatter accompanied the busy preparations. This was made up of sounds of sweeping, scrubbing, and clattering of kitchen utensils. Pa's wives worked in tandem, except for Pulaje, the last wife, who was denied access to anyone's food except hers. She's a witch, they said. I didn't think much about it, but her last two babies had precisely died three days after they were born, and villagers were beginning to point fingers. Pa's second wife, Yasero, was the mother to my best friend, Kado, and was in charge of burning off the fur from the goat, which was a suffocating process that emitted a pungent smell like burnt rubber. The women collectively spiced the meat in the backyard, but Ma was particularly in charge of cutting and washing the flesh as a first wife. Wives did assignments while barking commands. My Ma's first wife bracelet shone brightly like a commander drunk with power. She was always angry. I would be too if I had to share my husband with four other women. Past four wives and 11 legitimate children. So I'm going to stop here in the interest of time in chapter one. It continues, but it's important that I go to chapter 18. So this particular chapter just introduces the time. As you can see, there's different elements that are quite unique to that time and different from today. And it, it, it sets a premise of the kind of role that women had to play, as well as the fact that women's roles were in a marital, um, uh, in a marital form and not much more. So in chapter 18, May I invite Kemi? So Kemi, is the, she's the author of Profitable Problems, which I will talk about in a bit. So just help me read this. Please join me. So um, chapter 18, The Rally in Squares. In 1961, I was among several maids clustered around a small kitchen radio in the parish, jumping like fireflies as we listened to the big English words from an over-enthusiastic radio journalist from the big city. And so, we are confirming that Amadou Ahijo is now the first president of the Federal Republic of Cameroon. Yay! It was a euphoric, unanimous scream of butlers, cooks, cleaners, and guides, ex and guards, excited about something they knew nothing about. Two hours later, I was on duty standing still as I served Father Anthony in his office. He called suddenly. Yes, big father, I answered. Do you want independence? He asked. That question came as a surprise, and I was not sure what to answer. I don't know what that word means, father, I responded politely. A lie, of course. 
it means the black people will rule themselves and the whites will go away. Do you want the whites to go away? My necklace began to burn on my chest. I was confused and didn't know what answer I was supposed to give, especially because he was looking at me in an expectant way. No, I said hesitantly, a stream of sweat forming on my brows. Good, he said. And that was the end of the conversation. Father Andrew was looking at a newspaper with a grim expression on his face. He had a protruding belly, which had not stopped expanding since he was, ex he was ordained as a priest about a year back. The fact that he is Muslim seems disagreeable. Wouldn't you agree? Father Andrew said, rubbing his belly. I don't see how that would affect the work of God in these parts. Father Anthony replied, busy signing some papers. Father Andrew, dissatisfied, dropped the newspaper he was reading. I swiftly caught a glimpse of his tanned face and pearly smile. Father Andrew looked at me. Are the people happy about this man? He asked me. Not knowing he was speaking to me, I still held the teapot, looking straight ahead until he specifically made it known that he was talking to me. Yefon, he called out. I was a little startled. Yes, Father, I responded, walking back to him dutifully, with my head and chest up, holding my silver tray. Are the people happy with this president? Father Anthony looked at me too. After hesitating, I responded, I don't know. Even though I did, of course they were. Some Irish nuns will be visiting today from Bermenda. You are to show them around, after which you can take the day off, Father Andrew said. Happy independence, Father Anthony added, with a small smirk before dismissing me. I quickly dashed out and was able to breathe again when I was in the corridor. About five maids were fired that week. It turned out they had said they wanted independence. I was afraid. I didn't want to lose my job. Black leaders or white, I had to get to the city one day, and this was my only way. The nuns that came were old and sluggish with a strange addiction to flowers. A short walk from the parish house up to the hill and cathedral garden dragged on for so long that I sweated profusely as they stopped to gush over the smell of every single flower on our way. Father Naber is speaking about an initiative for the girls. One of them, who was introduced to me as Sister Rose, said, in between over-exaggerated oohs and ahs, her long, crooked nose buried in the rose garden. Yes, yes. A proposal went out to the bishop last month. I personally oversaw it. A lady of lords, they say, another one said, this one looked pretty in her cloak. They called her Sister Agnes. The school will train girls to live an exemplary life like Mary, and it will be admitted to pass the common entrance in list A, Sister Agnes added before turning up to me. Yeah, for I'd like some water, please. I curtsied and ran to go fetch it immediately, my necklace already glowing at the words common entrance. I had heard that expression before, but I didn't know what it meant. I wanted to be, I wanted to ask, but I was petrified. I soon returned with a cool pitcher and I poured her water. She looked at me. Sweet girl, she gently said. Maybe you can come to London when it's built. Maybe you can come to Lord's when it's built, she said. And I nodded shyly. My work shift ended that day and I could barely wait to go home. I ran down um, an overscrubbed flight of stairs, pulling my apron as soon as I stopped to catch the domino from a boy and blind man entertaining a cheering group of nuns with a song. Kada was waiting for me outside. I was determined to treat her with a stick of two of soya on the nearby squares in spite of how tired I was. Squares was one, developed, was one of the well-developed vicinities in Seoul with a huge cathedral and several growing businesses. It was also a convergence point for many nationalists who hung out in the bars and small shops at the side of the street. They had grown in numbers, a lot of young farmers who were now joining them preaching pro-black agendas since French Cameroon became dependent in 1960. Cado and I held hands. We strolled under the reddish-orange sky, chit-chatting like teenage girls about everything and nothing. A group of boys who were visibly drunk started whistling at us. Independence, independence, they sang as they breezed away. I smiled. A huge political frenzy welcomed us when we arrived squares. We squeezed through sweaty people, shouting the word independence. I studied the area. 
I studied the area. Even farmers were shouting, and I couldn't hide my fascination. Run your affairs without any interruption, a voice echoed loudly. Several others passed flyers around screaming, freedom from the whites. I chuckled to myself. It was good to see people in the village this fanatical about something. Sister, come drink with us, another man with a square head that looked like a box from Big Father's office called out. No, brother, I responded politely. We approached a congested soya stand, enveloped by an irresistible aroma where several nationalists stood, shouting orders like madmen to a thin, hard-working man whose lusterless skin was almost as black as charcoal in his grill. Where several skewered of marinated meat chopped into small, uneven chunks hissed over a smoldering flame. One attractive man wearing a royal blue shirt and tight trousers stood. He was enjoying a cold bottle of Amstel and a cigarette. I knew him well. He was a radical nationalist called Musa, who was a farmer turned de um, defendant's fighter. Kado had the biggest crush on him, even though his two other girlfriends were just as curvy. Musa whispered something in his friend's ear and both men started approaching us. I dreaded the stench of cigarettes, which would soon have been blown into my face. Smoking seemed to be synonymous with nationalism. And of course, Musa, Musa smoked like a chimney. My sister Yefon Kado readily greeted and I smiled back, my attention on the meat. How many the soya man asked us, fanning away some from his... Fanning away some from his perspiring face. I will pay for them, Musa said confidently. Take as many as you want, he added. I will pay for mine, thank you. I told him, and then turning to the soya vendor, I said I wanted three. I didn't have to look at them to feel their irritation, and soon, Kato's voice reduced to central whispers, leaving me at the uncomfortable mercy of Musa's friend. Okay, so this also continues. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, can we clap for it? Thank you very much for your help. I do want to explain the reason why I chose chapter 18 that we just read. The reason I chose it was the topic of today sets the premise as to what Africa used to be and where Africa is going and what role we each play as individual people. So I wanted to pick a, um, a chapter that kind of painted a picture of what it was like. So you have to understand that this book is set in a village council and these guys are confused between pre-colonialism where white people are their bosses as priests, as uh, 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 people who own the post office to now seeing black people become presidents or hearing about it because from the village they actually haven't seen any president. So I just tried to play a scene just that, that showed you that dynamic. Now without much ado, let me go into my topic for the day. To explain this topic, it's very important to explain what this book is actually about. The summary of the book. This book talks about a young woman that is born in the 1930s, pre-colonial times, whose only sole dream is to be an educated woman at a time when education is forbidden for women. The book is written as a trilogy. It's going to have a second and third part that will come out later. And each of these different books explore the different types in our history, ending where we are today, right, with Africa's problems, which, are, which is why I, I mentioned you. So over time, it's been read by a lot of people. It's, it, it, had, um, it became an Amazon best-selling book when it was highly downloaded on a digital series. Slide 18. Thank you. Now, the theme of Afri Africa Next this year is cooperate, collaborate, and innovate, looking at how we can unlock our potential and ensuring Africa's prosperity. Since we have a small crowd, I can actually ask a question. Um, Osi, I think I want to ask you that question. So, just because we don't have time to start exploring all of Africa's problems, Osi, can you help me summarize from your point of view, what are some things that you consider to be Africa's problems in the contemporary world that we currently live in now. Thank you, Sandra. So first of all, I must say that um, you're trusting me to summarize Africa's problems in, I don't know, maybe one sentence or one sitting. It's very admirable. Thank you. <laughs> it's very far-fetched also. Right. Um, so I think if we, ha if we are to critically look at Africa's problems without going deep, deep, deep down, we have a major problem of um, 
under productivity so we we need to get we need to get um, good health care we need to get um, good infrastructure in terms of um, logistics performance i mean roads rail waterways um we need to have we need to have functional healthcare systems but we can't have these things until the end users are able to pay for them that's how it works everywhere except we want to be socialist and well that has never worked so we can't have these things unless the end users are able to pay for them and the end users can't pay for them if they don't have jobs so for the end users to have jobs um we have to have establishments that keep churning out sustainable jobs you know um until that happens we can't have the rest of the things that we desire so i think chief of africa's problems is that we do not have this um, ecosystem that you know co-depends on one another for um productivity so we can't produce here we can't give jobs here we can't give jobs here it means we can't pay for anything we can't pay for anything it means everything just goes downhill from there but i think that's like if the shortest summary i can cook up thank you um africa's problems are many and we find that these problems exist in all 54 countries in different variants and so it makes it a bit difficult to like you said summarize it in one line the first one is i would like to explore the complex relationship that we have with colonialism which is why i had to go and read that part from my book and then i will tell us where we are today briefly and then what you can do reading the room i'm going to limit it to what it looks like we all here can do now when it comes to partnerships some characteristics that really come to mind are it takes two people um, whether that be myself and another person myself and the government myself and other businesses myself and organizations like this so is th there is a myself and you in different you know in every aspect of it so there's a very dual nature to partnerships that does have to be explored when we are figuring out what role we can play. And we have for about 1.4 billion people, and the earth right now is about 7 point something. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the AFCTA that happened. It was ratified in 2020. Are you familiar with that? So this is the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And the idea was to make trading among all the 54 African states easier. No taxes, movement is easier. Therefore, as what, as what Ose had said earlier, to make it easy for us to be able to afford buying products, therefore making the market easier. Now, to do that, there is a role that the government would play. And I know that in Africa, we've gone to a place where we try to ignore the government because we feel that the government has failed. But I do want to say, not as an expert, but just as me, that you cannot ignore the government. You cannot ignore the government. And when I say government, most people always think about like the president. You cannot speak about the success of a president without breaking it down to whether it be the legislative, the executive, the, judici the judiciary, from the Senate down all the way to a mayor, down the way to, all, all the way to you. So in terms of partnerships, what historical activity is happening in Nigeria? Sophie. Okay, so currently what's happening in Nigeria is the nation gearing up to the 2023 presidential election taking place sometime this month, hopefully. Okay. So that's the climate we're in at the moment, the tense political climate we're in. Thank you. Sometimes when you look at the intelligent African people, we all have the same problem. We do not get involved in politics. And so... It therefore seems as though people that are less competent, less trained, are the ones who go into politics, and then we sit down and point fingers at the effects of those things. So one thing that I do have to say about partnerships is partnering with the government, and it starts by voting whom needs to be in office. And I think Nigeria, everybody who's a citizen of Nigeria, has that kind of opportunity right now. Now, I want to focus, because this particular um, um, platform is hosting for about four days, and I believe there's about 400 different speakers, and each of these speakers have different proficiencies from business to uh, uh, the creative industry to like, music, film, books like myself. I really want to focus only on one aspect. There's many, there's many ways that we can improve how we partner, but I'm only going to focus on one, the one that I think I do have the jurisdiction to speak about. That is going to be the area of the mind. What kind of mind drives partnerships? 
and to go into that, let me start from colonialism, which is what I said before. Now, is anyone familiar with the problem, the colonial problem that we have in Africa today? You haven't said anything. Do you have any comment? All right. Is anyone familiar? Fola, what, what is your opinion about the colonial problem that we have today? Or do you think there is one? For me, I feel that we were not ready for independence okay. at the time because we were still learning what democracy is all about. And it is really affecting us till our present time because administrative wise, based on the fact on how our political, there is no there is no political stability as such, and it is from the administration point of view. Okay. And if we were at the time, if we, we had submitted to the white people to learn more, we would have been able to handle and be independent when, it, when we've learned a lot from them via experience. Please pass the microphone, Swala. What I think about you know, your question is that um, I think that colonialism created a, a superstructure mm -hmm. you know, that, um, that has made Africans grateful, you know, that made Africans grateful. So um, instead, of us to, instead of us to think about, oh, what value can we harness as a people? How do we, how do we process whatever thing we have? Is it, is it human resources? Instead of us to you know, think that way, we we start being grateful for being given a chance at the table. Oh, there's um um you you won a Grammy as a black person. Oh yes, that's awesome for black people, you know. And we we start we start um, seeing things like we we have to learn. <laughs> we don't even <laughs> we have to we have to learn more from you know the white people and stuff like that. So. I think it, it created that superstructure that made us feel like we haven't done anything before. We've never achieved anything. We just, we just were. It's the same superstructure that makes him feel that oh, we should have learned more from them. But were we, were we, were we, were we always, were we that primitive? I mean, that we need to learn how to be social. We need to learn how to s s be in society. Point is that it is that thing. It is that thing that has made us, people like I and you, start thinking that we should have depended on them a little bit more. But then, if you check, you realize that we, we had something before their emergence on, before they ever set foot here. So, I mean, what happened to that? But then, how they related with us made us feel that this is how it is. Oh, they were, they were like the perfect definition of sanity and society. And if we stayed, if they had stayed a little bit longer, we would maybe have inculcated that and we would be better for it. But that's a lie. Thank you, Ose. Thank you, Fola. I'll come back to you, Sophie. So I do want to say something important. So what I will say is, um, yes, there is a colonial problem. To address that, you have to look at the colonial administration, and I call it like the method to the madness. I um, also said something when we were speaking. You said that you were made to think, right? And so if you actually, I mean, this is not even my opinion. It's the actual political and judicial framework that was used to colonize us. So there were primarily about three to four main colonial styles that were used back in the day. So the main one which Nigerians are familiar with is probably indirect rule. Most Nigerians are familiar because that's how Nigeria was colonized, right? You also have assimilation and you have corvée. And there's many different like, like semi-structures that fall within all of those. So it was actually an intentional approach to say, this is how I'm going to make this person become. For the sake of time, I won't go too detailed in, but I will just mention what it has to do where we are today. Now, let's take indirect rule, for example. Let's look at the ECOWAS which is where Nigeria, Nigeria is part of that economic sector. Let's look at ECOWAS, for example. So when you think of ECOWAS, you're thinking of the different, like right now there's 15 countries because I believe Mauritius left at this point. So there's 15 countries. When you look at them, you know, Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, all these countries, they have problems, 
but it seems as though maybe they have a stronger sense of identity as people. Has anyone observed that? That if you go to Ghana or if you come to Nigeria, it seems as though the people on some level have a sense of identity. I'm from here, I'm from here. They're very proud of, like Nigeria, or they carry last, things like that. You hear things like that that kind of relate to identity. Does that make sense? That Africa is on God's mind. Netflix, Amazon, now even Showmax. What are they all coming to do here? Is what I want to know, right? And so maybe what that means is that um, every great empire has its time. And I believe that now Africa is being prepared for its season. If it is true that this is a time where God is looking at this continent differently, then maybe it's true that you and I are partners in this particular vision and that we will partner at the level at which we are, irrespective of what career we're in. Now, let's link that back to how they were colonized. The indirect rule works through um, a structure you're already familiar with. It works through a monarch, through your king that was already there. And as also explained before, we already had like systems in place before colonialism, even though we're made to believe that that was not the case. So these things work by going through a phase that you already know. Therefore, you, f you don't really feel the colonialism on the scale that other countries did. And I'll, exp I'll, I'll explain myself in a bit. And it seems as though the regions in ECOWAS in Eco in Eco are having a higher economic, um, um, like they, 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 are, they seem to be richer than the contemporaries that were colonized by the French, for example. Now, Yefon is set in Cameroon. Cameroon is in the Semak zone. Is anyone familiar with the Semak zone? Semak zone? So it's, in English, it's the um, Central African Economic and Monetary Community. So the way that Cameroon was actually a strange example because Cameroon was administered both with indirect rule in two regions, in two out of ten regions. Now the remaining four-fifths of the country was administered in what is called assimilation, relies on assimilation to make you into a Frenchman. So what, that, what happens is if, you, if you've traveled around Central Africa or if you've been to Paris, and hung out with Africans who live in France, you will see that they have a sense of, where are you from? They'll say, I'm French. You hear that first, before I'm from Guinea, Equatorial, or I'm from Cameroon. As opposed to if you met a Nigerian who happened to live in London, they'll say, I'm Nigerian. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So I'm saying that, I'm trying to speak as fast as I can to say that the colonial method was very intentional, and you see it in today's economy. In the French regions, our currency is literally called France, for example, and, and, and France literally, in every way that I mean, controls the economy. Nigeria has Naira. Ghana has SEDI, for example. Does that make, do you guys understand where I'm coming from? That it seems as though one has to look at that. So if we're speaking about the role that all of us play, I already spoke about the government and I summarized it for time. But let me focus on us here. All of us look young, maybe under 35, 36 and we, we probably come from different sectors so what do we do in terms of how we partner with this continent and by continent i am not only speaking about nigeria and by continent i am also including the digital world because from in in our time you can sit here and you can reach the world at the, at, at, at your fingertips so we came up with five important concepts these concepts are actually inspired by the character of Yefon. In, in, her, in her character traits, she is very ambitious and she's, she goes after her dream, which is to be educated, knowing that she could die for it. But she did it because she felt like it was a requisite thing for, which was important for the advancement of her environment, her village. So just go to slide 30 and I'll, I'll go through it very fast. Guys, we have a mantra. I'm going to share this later on in a way that you can use it later. So this mantra, you can look through it later at home. And you can also use it when you're making active decisions and making partnerships of every kind. If you can make it big, that would be a little bit more helpful. Thank you so much. So Yefon is spelled Y-E-F-O-N. And the Y stands for young, right? I think what I'm trying to share today is that we do have to understand that youth is not punishment. It seems as though in the African, um, uh, uh, living in Africa, you're made to feel that being young is a bad thing or, or you know, what the old person sees standing up, you who is young, even if you climbed on the top of an Oroko tree, you would never see it. I do believe that as young people, there is a place where we honor the old people. 
where we respect what they have done before in the partnerships, the, the way that they have partnered on behalf of Africa, all of our politicians, all of our business leaders, they did do some things right and did others wrong, but it feels as though, as young people, we only focus on what was done wrong. Now, the challenge with that is, if you do that, you cannot improve. You may think that you can, but if you look at case studies, for example, if you go into like Harvard Business School and how they teach their, their business classes, they spend about 70% of their classes looking at case studies. You have to look at case studies. You have to see what worked and what didn't work. And as Africans, we have to honor those people and say, you know what, I'm not going to take everything that you say, but I will honor you. So I believe what I'm trying to inspire here is that let's not be inspired by anyone or made to feel that we're foolish because we're young. As a matter of fact, be proud of your foolishness of youth. You know why? Because you can make so many mistakes and you can bounce back. If you look at the average entrepreneur in America that we look at as successful today, these guys have probably done about 10 businesses in their lifetimes and they failed. And because they were able to take all the lessons from that, now they are great. We have a lot of examples that I cannot um, go into at the moment. But the very first principle of partnerships is that you must always look at your partnerships from a young perspective that this partnership can endure any mistake and you're going to do it anyways. And you're going to do it not just anyways, but you're going to do it now. With youth comes a sense of immediacy. We want to just like, like act right now. We can't wait. And sometimes that is discouraged, but for the sense of partnerships where we are as a country, each person needs to be partnering at every kind of scale. It doesn't matter how nano it is or how grand it is. So can I ask you a question? So what does Y stand for? We are young. Thank you. So the Y is that we are young. And we're going to go to the next slide again. We don't have as much time to... Different concepts with examples as we planned. But the E stands for empower. I know that in Nigeria, for my time here, when you hear empower, you feel like putting money in your hands. This is not what I mean, please. I mean that, um, and I will borrow from something that... Um, she said in her book, which I do recommend that everyone reads, I'll share that with you guys. She speaks about the fact that there comes a time where we as Africans, based on all the problems that Osei had mentioned earlier, we do need to be more intentional about the way that we structure our partnerships and businesses. We don't longer have the time to just only make profit. We can't survive it right now because there's many sectors that will rely on us investing in ourselves, by ourselves and for ourselves. Now, what that means is you first of all have to decolonize your mind. And I'm not saying this in some rara, stay woke kind of thing. I am woke, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the time has come where we have to respect the West, but also respect ourselves and empower ourselves by going to learn what really are the problems and what role do I play? Who am I going to partner with and why, right? A time has come where, based on the way the earth is going, this is not my opinion. These are, you know, scientists are looking at the way the earth is evolving. We cannot be structuring partnerships for businesses that do not look at in what way are we giving back to the earth. It can't just be take, take, take. Which is what, again, like I said, our fathers before us did. We also have to empower ourselves with the power of failed partnerships, which I mentioned before. And I do want to say something very important. Now, most people don't pay attention to the creative industry. I'm not speaking about this because I'm a creative person. I'm speaking about it because it's part of the type of partnership we have to have moving forward. Can everyone just look at me for one second? This is very important. So, sorry, about how old are you? Not your age, but the age range. Uh-huh, great, you're 27, 27, your 20s, late 20s. So, do you remember watching American movies when you were young? More cartoons, okay. I'll say, do you, did you watch a lot of American movies when you were young? Is there anybody here who watched, who can, uh, because my question um, needs to be asked someone that saw a lot, of, a lot of American movies for them to understand what I'm trying to say. Okay, so okay, my question is, do you observe how from a lot of movies that were made back in the day, whether it be from the kind of characters that Marvel was creating, Captain America, um, the movies that were done, Men in Black, Independence Day, all those big blockbuster movies seemed in some way to have a subconscious message that America was a superpower and was going to save you. Did anyone grow up kind, like feeling that way? Kind of? I began visiting America when I was nine years old, and I would eventually move there to live at the age of 20. And I remember coming into school, and I just imagined that everybody was super rich. I just, that was what I imagined in my head, right? And I remember going out after class, and I'm like, oh, let's go have a drink. Let's have tea or something. And everybody's like, oh, I can't afford it. 
And I'm like, what do you mean you can't afford it? Oh, I have student loans. I'm broke. Wait, what do you mean you're broke? You're American. You know, and that's just one example of a lot of things that need to be decolonized. But we were told in every film, in every show, in every cartoon that this particular way of thinking was more superior than us, right? So what I'm saying is that in our partnerships, we also have to highly consider communication. We have to partner with creative people that know how to spread messages to the mind in a subliminal way. This is something that Africa needs to focus on because if you look at the images that have been shown to the West, you have the iconic black child with you know, uh, a fly hanging around its nose and the fly never leaves. You have the picture of war and all these things for Nigeria. You have the picture of 419. Yes, those things are true, but they're not the only thing that is there. So you do have to empower yourself in how you're thinking for partnerships. And you have to empower other people by one, telling them what you know. Number two, what her book talks about, how you can support consciously other businesses and also the country. Empower. Thank you. So, Yefon, I am Yefon, is I am what? I'm young, I'm empowering, great. So let's go to F. Again, I don't have too much time, but I would say the most important thing. You know, a lot of us do things without knowing the why. The biggest issue with most African, most failed African partnerships, whether it be politically or in business, is that the why was very fuzzy. Are we doing this thing for our ego? Is it for us? Are we doing it for beneficiaries? And if we are, what do they need? And if it's what they need, then that's all that should be the focus of a partnership. Not what I need or what I look like when I need it. Or what would they say about when it's done? A lot of the partnerships that have happened post-colonially, not just in Nigeria, everywhere seems to have that, that one ingredient, you know? The other thing that one would say about focus, we have to focus on continuity. We are the masters of starting what never finishes. We're the masters of starting things that we cannot pass on the baton. So you look at companies like Guinness, companies that have existed for 100 years. I, I really wish everyone here so much depth and insight on every kind of partnership that is sitting on your mind right now and that God would really be with you in whatever you do. So we don't have too much time, but in case anyone has a question, comment, remark, this will be the time uh, for five quick minutes before we kind of wrap up. And then we can just kind of network and figure out where we can get the book, get her book, things like that. Any question, comment, remark? The microphone is with, with Ose, with... Hello, Sandra. Hi, Kami. <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, I know this was such a rushed session, and I really wish we had time. I really wish we had more people in the room. Yes. Because you've given such a powerful, summarized, but powerful, really um, powerful session today that touches on many things from the mind you know, to how we must decolonize our minds and reorient people and the roles we have to play as young people. I would like to appeal, if possible, yes. I don't know how this slide can be made available, but if possible, you know, we, we could just do more to put it out there because more people um, really need to hear about it. Hi. Thank you so much, Sandra. I'm sorry that I kept missing you. I've never heard it before, so my brain is trying to... Actually, one how of do you the spell characters it? in your book is my namesake. So the what? name the name in your book is Kome. But oh. mine but oh. mine is Kume. It just replaced okay, the with, o you. with you. Yes, that's a bong. Noted. Yeah. Kume. Can you help me write that? I want to remember. Thank you so much, Kume. I'm with you. Yeah, so thank you so much for the session. So I haven't read the book, so I was just to be honest, I wasn't expecting a like a full on discussion. I was just expecting to come and sit down and listen to someone read a book. But this was very insightful. I mean, I learned that there are 54 countries in Africa today. <laughs> I didn't know that. But yeah, it was a great session. Thank you for challenging my mind and, you know, inspiring me to be your fun. I've, I've gotten the book already on Okada Books. Thank you. I would thank love to get so a hard much. copy if okay, there is. Thank you. So, but yeah, thank you so much for the session. And I really appreciate it. Thank God I waited. So, yeah. Um, I mean, amazing session. I genuinely enjoyed myself. Thank you. And, and I think that, I mean, for somebody who knows you, I got to know you a little bit more from this session. And that's very, very, that's very wonderful because, I mean, everybody's figure out a will some more, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I, I think that you shared 
I think that you sh- even with little time, I think that you shared very deep insights about um, our Africanity, how we came to be here, and I like that you that you divided the you know the, the settings. You talked about you know contemporary Africa now, colonial Africa, pre-colonial Africa, you know post-colonial Africa, and um, you 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 understood how it's a very delicate subject by the way very very delicate but you understood how mentally we were at every stage and you led the audience to you know to you led the audience through that journey it's it was a very i don't i don't stand rubbish you know that i don't i don't, I don't, I don't. I really, 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 really enjoyed myself. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much, Ose. So, Sophie, and then Fola, and then we're good to go. <laughs> I'm going to be very, 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 like, you know when they say transparency, I am coming to you guys naked. But you just can't see it. But you what I'm trying it. to say, <laughs> I'm going to be very honest. I have an issue. I have for an it. issue. Please, Please go I for want it. Kemi to also see me because I'm being very vulnerable right now. Tell us. So, I have an issue with reading. It's something... I feel like it's the way my mind was programmed when I was young. You read to pass an exam. And anything else is just, please, I don't want to touch it. And I feel like subconsciously, that's how my brain is wired. Okay. I don't read unless I have to read. Okay. I have books in my house that I don't read. From self-help to fictional to all sorts. And Yefon, <laughs> my dear Yefon, I'm coming to you at home. Yefon is sitting pretty in my house, collecting dust. And I have not read Yefon. And like I said before I started, I'm being extremely vulnerable. Which I love about and you. And this is Thank something you. that even one of my really good friends is trying to help me with. She buys me books and I just keep piling them. So... I started to identify with Yefon, the character, because we're in a time where a lot of the decisions about the things around us as Nigerians kind of lies, the decisions, it's in our hands. It is literally in your hands. And this is also why history is very important. And just this small, this very short session really made me start to question a lot of things about history. How will I teach my children if I'm not even going back to history? Do you understand I me? Mean, there's only so much your parents can tell you or educate you about, but you actually have to go back to your history, go back to your roots and read and understand how certain things are done. I didn't know that there was such thing as indirect and direct colonialism, for example. I didn't know that there was a technique. I just assumed, yeah, they came, the white people came and they carried us or they sold us. But how the technique, the skill that they used in doing that is something that I never thought was a thing, but now I know. I have learned something new today. So going back to history, know your history, and actually, just because there's a history or the way things were done, does not mean that your narrative moving forward has to be constructed, or it has to now be, because they did it that way, my narrative is now left to the wind. You actually still have the ability to control your narrative, however way it started in the past. I want to say something important. So do you guys know that there's some Nigerian people that it doesn't matter the outcome of the election, their lives will not be affected in any way. I was at, as bougie as this is going to sound for the point I'm trying to make, I was at the yacht club in Ikoi like two days ago and I was sitting down with, you know, some folks. And I was listening to, you know how someone is, did did you guys, did anyone go to boarding school? Did you know anyone in your school that told the story of on the way to the cat's house? Did did, did you guys know people like that? So in our schools in Cameroon, there were kids that, they're telling you a story, and the story is so distracting because you're like, wait, what? Yeah, so as I passed by to go to my father's room by the cat's house where the cat's TV is, wait, what? And so I'm saying that to say that exaggerating, you know. So anyways, I met, you know, sitting with real kids who are not exaggerating. The cat does have a TV. And when I say cat, I mean something that you don't expect to have a TV, right? And people don't understand that, like, at the end of the day, the outcome of the election actually affects the middle class if we have one. The everyday person 
who is like I think most of Nigeria's economic class, and people don't they have a sense of apathy like oh this does not concern me because I'm whatever I'm going to do. But no, it does concern you because. That is one thing that you can do differently. And I'm not saying that your candidate would win or not. I don't know. But at least you know that, like, I did this. I had a chance. Because I feel like I'm, I'm saying, I'm picky banking off something that Sophie said, which touched me as a person. When you look at those, like, historical stories, you look at it like, oh, if I was there, I can't do Does that make sense? You hear about the Nazis and you say, oh, someone came and told you that um, if you don't kill that person, you two would die. And you tell yourself, oh, nah, I would have stood up for the underdog. I would No, you really genuinely would not have because when it's happening today, you protect your house, protect your head. We all do. I'm not going to say you. I don't mean, I mean, we all do. Um, me, for example, I know that I can be sometimes the beneficiary of the situation. I mean, I'm not the one doing anything bad, but I'm benefiting from it. I don't want to sit in a queue for 200 years. I'm going to pay someone to do it, you know? And I can be honest enough to say... But if I keep doing that, you know, and I think when I was preparing this particular class, I thought of this line and I myself, I was like, wow, you're part of the problem, you, Sandra, because you're enabling a system. And I'm, talking like you, I'm talking about in the world. So I think what that means, is if you say that you want to partner to create an Africa that is not yet there, but then the spiritual law is that you see it as though it were, right? And as though it were means that things are functional, things are working, markets are open. Uh, and by markets, I mean, I mean economies. Things are, 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 you know, the middle class exists. And all of these things, then you really have to say, like, when I say I am EF1, it, it, it's a very hard, honest conversation you have to have with yourself. And you see that maybe in some areas you're strong. Maybe in other ones you just need a lot of work. And that, even to myself, I'm reminding myself to say that I too need to work on some aspects and to, and to partner differently, you know, in the way that I enable systems that are, are, are set that do not benefit the common man. All right, I'm going to finish with you and then we can take some pictures or whatever we want to do and um, have a picture, whatever. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, everybody, for staying around to have a beginning, middle, and end of this old saga. We really appreciate you because this is at work um, and it's, it takes a village to make people up. I don't know the proper, but for the fact that you're here, yeah, this is like bringing, for you to listen to us or to wait actually took a lot of work. When I mean work, Miss Sandra, the devil works, but Miss Sandra works harder. Because the way she just works, I'm like, this thing has to come through because she has put in a lot of work to it. Thank you, Ma, for Thank being you. a case study for me to be Thank able you for your to. Help. Thank you so much. To just, okay, if it, it's not even easy for people like Miss Sandra, so why is it going to be easy to just do small thing in my own corner? So it's this whole story since last week we've been going through it and i say that okay you always tell telling me that to make your film you would have to go through all of this yeah. so i see even in paradise there's always strain in it so thank you for bringing all of this together and thank you for actually opening my mindset to a creative person um content yeah where you can actually analyze i'm an english for a major student so the way you analyzed your story gave me another insight that you, you can actually create but you have to be open-minded to actually analyze it aside from your contextual and literal meaning thank you thank you guys um i would try my best to uh i was i was hoping that we were able to connect a bit better here but I do know everyone, and now I have her contact, and even those who left, I would make sure that they get the materials and, you know, were able to cross um, that one. And then that would be it. So let's just take, like, one or two pictures, and then I think we can go. But, guys, I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you.